for another season and to start the training class. If you've got any questions as we're going through this, please don't hesitate to raise your hand, type in the question um, in the chat box, and uh, we will try to answer you as quickly as possible. Um, we've got everybody muted for right now, but the intention is as you raise questions, you raise your hand, We'll unmute you so you can go ahead and ask your questions. I typically like to have a very interactive class. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask questions as we go through. Um, before we go ahead and start, does anybody have any questions that they would like to be addressed uh, before the class starts or even better, do you have any particular topic that you're looking for? Please put it in the chat uh, box um, so that I can make sure that I don't overlook um, those topics as we go through. So um, the agenda for tonight, um, as I said, it you know I really like to have some back and forth talking. So if keeping you on mute becomes too much of a uh, a complication we may take you off of mute but again then i would ask that you put yourself on mute so that we don't hear all the background noise because i know that on special olympic calls sometimes uh, background noise um, can be pretty bad and i think some of it is the uh, software being used um tonight i'm going to go back over some of the rules summary most of you are already familiar with it but i it's always worth going over it, some of the training consideration and equipment, and I'll go over the divisioning process that I do that could help you in getting your athlete properly divisioned for uh, the qualifiers. And finally, I've got a couple of additional resources at the very end. Um, so um, please note, that under the, the rules and stuff, really the state of Maryland has the rule and Kendall does review the rules during the pre-webinar. She particularly focuses on any of the changes to the rules. Um, so <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll defer to Kendall during that particular presentation or the webinar uh, for the Maryland specific rules. So tonight I'll talk mostly about um, the rules in general. As we all know, the Special Olympics regulation requires that the bocce court be uh, 60 foot long and 12 foot wide with foul lines properly marked off as well as a mid-court line. Um, we typically play on grass, um, so Please do keep in mind when you do work with your athlete, you know, we shouldn't be practicing in jungles um, where the grass is a foot tall. I've seen that on sometimes where, where we practice. Um, there's always uh, two sets of four bocce balls, once for each side. Um, one set of balls typically is green and the other is typically red. Although there are quite a few manufacturers out there that have two other colors mixed in um, together. Um, and they're usually just as acceptable. They just make for interesting um, competition. If you have the multiple colors, what I've done on my team is when I've got the different colors like that, I'll break up the sets. So I still end up with just two colors for the athletes to compete against each other. Um, length of the game. This is an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> during competition, um, we're supposed to go to 12 points on the singles, um, as well as the doubles, and 16 points if we're playing team. However, it's quite possible that going to 12 points could lead to a very, very long game. So um, it's not uncommon that a time limit is placed. I've seen time limits of 30 minutes and 20 minutes done regularly. 
Um, when you do your practices, think it over. Is it effective? Is it not effective? It all depends on how you run your uh, practices. But certainly when you're at competition, your athletes should be aware that there is a time limit and sh therefore should be prepared that they may not reach 12 points. And therefore that might change the strategy of how they play uh, the different frames. Uh, again, most of you are familiar with this. One side has a set of the four green bocce and the other side has the four red bocce balls. Um, the balls should be, always be tossed in an underhand fashion, um, remembering that it, to be a proper throw in the underhand method, it does mean that the ball is released below the um, waistline. Um, athletes must stand behind the foul line when delivering um, a ball. At the beginning of the game, um, if you have a coin, flip the coin, heads or tails determines who the winner is, half one of the teams call it. Um, another easy way to do it if you don't have um, coins is put your hand behind your back and ask the athlete to give you a number one through five and you've in, in the back in your back your hand you've picked a number and once the athlete has picked his or her number then bring your hand forward to show what number you had on your fingers um, whoever is the closest to the number wins uh, the toss if you want to call it that and gets to decide Another particular item that I've seen that we struggle with athletes uh, during competition is what happens if an athlete throws the polina out and doesn't get it across the midline? Um, a lot of time athletes and particularly our parents slash coaches, um, fans, et cetera, on the on the sideline don't understand this rule the athlete gets three attempts um if after three attempts the athlete cannot get the polina across the midline then the other team gets one opportunity if that athlete is from the other team is throwing the polina and is un unsuccessful then the official will place the polina in the center on the opposite end foul line. Um, we got to remember one thing. At no time during this whole process does the team who's won the right to throw the first ball loses that opportunity. So if the athlete that successfully threw the Blaina across after the first team threw was unsuccessful for three times. That athlete doesn't throw the first ball. It goes back to the team that had won the right to toss the ball. Um, and that's a that's a tough one for people to remember because they feel, wait a minute, I threw the Polina, I get to throw the first ball. No, that's not the way the rule is. Uh, so the deliver the players deliver the plane uh, the their balls back and forth. We remember always that the ball the um, closest to the Polina means that that team doesn't throw the next ball. Um, and if it means that one team has the closest ball and the other team throws all four balls, um, and can never get closer to the Polina than the first team, that's it. That's the way it, it's played. And the first team um, will then deliver the last three balls after the, uh, the second team has thrown their first. Um, so remember to call balls in or out. Um, that's how we usually do it at, at our practice. We always call red in or green in. 
Um, yeah, I've heard it at the competition. They'll all they'll say red ball in, green ball rolls. It, you know, things like that makes it easier for athletes to know. So know your athlete and see what's the easiest for them to learn and to follow. Um, as I said before, the sequence of throwing continues until all, all the balls have been used up. Um, to determine the points, it's whichever team has the most balls the closest to the plena, and I think the next frame shows it much uh, better. No, that was, so in this case, the red ball is closer to the plena, so that is one score, one point for the red. The green gets no points at all. If there had been a second ball for the red team closer to the Polina than what that one green ball is, it'd be two points for the red, and it continues on like that until um, all the until all the closest balls from the same color have been counted. Uh, during the game, this is where I want to kind of stretch. Um, and make you think through. Um, the rules do not say that you must alternate players when you have teams, whether it is doubles or four man, four persons team. The, uh, well, a four persons team, everybody gets only one ball, but there isn't a rule that says player A goes first, player B goes second, player C for the bigger teams goes third, and players D goes last. It, it really doesn't matter what order they, they follow. And at least in Montgomery County, we work very hard with our athletes, where some of our athletes will be constantly changing on every single frame, who goes first, who goes second, um, who throws two balls in a row, who doesn't. And things like that. And the reason for that, um, I'm a firm believer that when you throw that first ball and you didn't get it close enough, so now you're, the other team has to throw the ball. If you throw your second ball, you've got a greater chance of getting closer to the Polina because of the muscle memory. Your body will know, well, wait a minute, I threw that ball this hard. It went too far, so I got to back off. Nope, it went too close or it hit it. I got to ease off or, you know, it, or I didn't get it close enough. So now I've got to throw it harder. And so that a lot of the athletes quickly learn that particular thing. So that's why many times will encourage on our teams a player to throw both of their balls in sequence if it's appropriate. Um, what I've noticed, though, at the state games, especially early in the morning, is that rule isn't always well understood by the volunteers. So I recommend that if you've trained your athletes to play like that, at the beginning of the state games, you know, if you see that kind of error, work with the officials to make sure that that gets corrected. It usually gets corrected very easily, very quietly, and nobody gets embarrassed, nobody gets upset. But for, for the athletes, it's very important that it gets done. Um, who throws the first ball? You know, whether you're throwing the Polina in the first ball or you're throwing the first ball because the other team threw the Polina in the first ball really doesn't matter. It's again, in my opinion, it's a strategy. Look at your teams, look at who are playing and determine which one's going to give your team the best advantage. Um, you know, there are sometimes I've seen teams where they'll, the first person to throw is very good at putting a blocker out there and blocking. Therefore, the Polina now has a ball in front of it that's blocking 
And it makes it a lot tougher then for other people to get close to the point. That's one strategy. And so those teams will use that player to throw first. Um, you know, again, it's how you want to coach your team and how your players react to that kind uh, of, of throws. So it's a judgment call. I've learned that it changes from seasons to season. Uh, the players don't always come back with the same strength, the same knowledge, and you discover the first few weeks. One of the toughest things to teach to athletes, and it took us years and years to do it here in Montgomery County, is teaching the athlete that when they're on their last frame and they're ahead and they've got that they're winning that game. Don't throw the ball and take a chance of knocking the other balls around and potentially losing the game. So we're teaching them to just simply drop the ball over the foul line. And let me tell you, some athletes get it and some athletes don't. The ones that get it, Truly, when they do it and they see the reaction of the coaches, they have a great time because now they realize they've done a play that the coaches have been working so hard for them to learn. And they and for them, it's a tremendous um, boost to see the coaches getting so happy over it. Um, Again, on the scoring side, only one side can receive points in a frame. Um, as I said earlier, only one point, a point is awarded for each bocce ball of the same color, which is closer to the Polina than the closest ball of the opposing team. Um, in the case of where two opposing bocce balls are positioned very close to the Polina, you should measure it. And if the bocce uh, balls are exactly the same distance from the Polina, then no points are awarded for that frame. Well, that, that assumes that there's no other ball closer to the Polina. I have seen many situations where, you know, the green team will have a ball closer to the Polina, and then you'll have a green and a red ball that are exactly the same di distance from the Polina, um, but further out. In that case, the green team gets one point because the other two balls knock each other off point-wise. Again, as I go through this and um, you've got questions, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. Here's that drawing that I was looking for earlier that shows that, you know, there's two balls, two red balls that are closer to the green balls. Therefore, it's two points for the red team. Um, back to throwing what's a legal throw. Um, players are permitted to roll or toss the, the bocce ball or Polina in an underhand delivery. Um, I want to stress that the underhand delivery is defined as releasing the ball below the waist. Um, you know, I've seen athletes hold the ball with in the palm of their hands with the palm of their hands facing down. And I've seen it right the other way around where the palm of their hands is upright. Whichever way the athlete is comfortable, let them pick it. Pick it. Um, it is always better to throw it with one hand and it ought to be your dominant side that you use to throw the ball. However, <clears throat> we have many athletes that physically can't do it with one hand and do it with two. And certainly that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and it's encouraged that they do that. Um, if, however, they can't carry the ball and throw it, um, then you always have the option of using a ramp um, for those athletes. I, I know we haven't seen that in the state games much, if any at all, in Maryland.
but I know that in the high school program, it's used a lot more. There's no reason why at the state level, we couldn't start using that for some of our athletes. The, the other thing that we'll do um, at the state games is we'll use short courts, um, and I'm sure we'll continue to offer that in the future. Um, so, and, and I'm sure there will be more debates as to do we do short courts or do we require athletes to do ramps? So stay, stay tuned for that because those will be part of the Maryland rules and Kendall will provide them at the webinars. Uh, key thing is the athlete must have at least one foot in the court. And we tend not to see very often where an athlete will put one foot in and one foot out of the court to try to take an advantage of an angle and stuff. Again, it's one of those things because we don't see it that often. It's legal, but we tend not to see it often. We may have officials that say, no, nope, you can't do that during the competition. And again, when that happens, I stress again, work with the officials um, at the state games or at the qualifier that you're at. And those um, kinds of issues get resolved really quickly. However, if you're in a wheelchair, you've got to be, you got to have the entire wheelchair in the court um, to throw. Um, then again, where should the wheelchair be? Where should the ramp be? Where should the feet be? And it really comes down to whatever you have has got to be behind the foul line. So, um, and, and the definition here, as you can see in the drawings, is you can have it completely behind, or you can have the toe touching the foul line, as long as the tip of the toe is behind the front edge of the line. Now, folks, I don't coach to have your foot on the line because it becomes real hard to you know, if a, if the referee says foul, how do you argue that thing? You know, it becomes a judgment call. It becomes a lot easier when – that's why I coach stay behind the line. Don't put any part of your foot. Don't put any part of the ramp. Don't put any part of the wheelchair over the line at all. Stay behind it. You know, and if even if you've got a little bit of grass space behind it, it isn't going to make that much of a difference on how you're going to score. Stay behind it, and you will not get called a uh, foot foul. Legal throws. Uh, players may hit the side of the board. Matter of fact, that's a strategy. Some players are very good about hitting the side of the board and rolling it all the way down. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, they'll put the polina up against the side of the board and then they'll start rolling their balls down along the side. It certainly it's a method to teach. I teach that method for a lot of my athletes. Um, going all the way to the end of the board usually means that you're you've gone well past the polina. Um, but that doesn't mean that that ball is out of bounds either. It's still a ball that's in play. Um, if a ball rolls and strikes another ball, that's all part of the game. Now, if it knocks a ball out of the court, then the ball that leaves the court is out of play. The ball that hit the ball, but that ball that that did the hitting, stays in court, that ball's still legal, and that's a good ball. That's a good play. You know, if, um, if you hit, if you have a ball that rolls on top of the sideboard or the end board, it says here it's ruled as a dead ball and removed from the court. Reality of it is if you use a round pipe or a semicircular pipe, 
to mark off the edge of the courts, it doesn't matter if that ball rolls up on the on the sideboard. Laws of physics says that if you're still on one side, it's going to roll back into the court. If you've rolled over to the other side, it's going to roll out of bounds. So it doesn't matter how much the ball rolls up on a round um, court. It's If it stays in bounds, it's not going to get called out of bounds. Now, if you've got two by sixes or two by tens, and I've seen some of the competition <clears throat> sites out of the States built like that and the ball does roll on top of the board yeah it gets called out of bounds because that truly it's clearly on top of the board um if the polina is hit out of the court um, then the whole frame is declared dead and we start over the frame at the same end that you started before <clears throat> Um, if a bocce ball is hit out of the court by another bocce ball, it is ruled dead, as I said before, and it's not placed back in the court. Um, how do you measure? This is one that I've seen can be oftentimes uh, a difficulty, and, and I want to try to emphasize on this one. Most of us use a roll a roll up tight tape measure to do the measuring and so we'll take out part of the steel tape we'll lock it into place and then we'll put the tape measure down and we'll measure between the bocce ball and the polina whenever you do this always put the free end of the tape measure up against the bocce ball and put the end that has still has the rest of the rolled up tape over the polina. And the reason behind this is against laws of physics. You're less likely to move the big bocce ball by tapping up against it with the tape than you are with the polina. The polina is just so small and so light that you just tap a little with the tape measure, you're going to end up in some cases changing the distance and it can make on a close game it could make the difference as to who gets points any questions so far hey Rennie, we did have one pop up it's is there a limit to how high the ball can arc during a throw if the throw is underhand and released below the waist not that i'm aware of folks you know, the, the question really becomes is, did they really release it under the waist? Um, and by the way, the waist isn't when the athlete's standing up. If that athlete crouches way down, I've seen that happen, where they're almost on their knees, they're giving themselves a lot less room to have that arc to pick up the speed and throw the ball. So sometimes you're going to have to coach some of the athletes not to kneel down when they're throwing the ball, that they really want to stand a little bit more erect. Yeah, have the knees bent and everything else, but so that they give their arms more of a freedom to throw. And again, to answer the question, I'm not aware that there is a uh, height limit. The other big thing is if you put all your energy in height, you're you're not the ball's not going to go that far but then again you know when we went to baltimore a few years back when jason organized one of these training sessions the guys in that church that italian league some of those guys were throwing the balls fairly high if i remember correctly so that it would come down it would jump over the blockers and then it would come down to hit some of the balls um, but those guys, in my opinion, were professionals. I don't know if our athletes are good enough to do that same kind of uh, throws and knock different balls out of the way. 
Any other questions? So far, that is all I've received. Okay. Um, coaching or instructional assistance may not be provided by coach or teammates once a player steps into the court. Um, players, once they step into the court, they can't come back out to get a, some coaching assistance. Now, <clears throat> let's make it clear here, folks. If your players are capable of moving in and out of the court after they throw the ball, they ought to come out whenever they're not throwing. And they ought to go to the chairs or sit down. If they want to talk to a coach and the coach wants to coach them, they got to go all the way to that line. But I have a philosophy, and this is my personal philosophy. It's not in the rules and stuff. I figure once, once I get to state games, my job as a coach of coaching the athletes, telling the athletes what to do, where to throw the ball, how to throw the ball, do it fast, do it slow, I'm done. If I haven't taught them as much as they can absorb in a season, I'm not going to get that much more into their minds on the day of competition. Those athletes really need to know on their own how to do it. But that's my personal philosophy. You know, different coaches have different things. I know in the high school that the coaches are constantly coaching every, to the last second that the employee, that, that the athlete, uh, <coughs> are throwing the balls. What I really do um, encourage is that when we have unified teams or teams, rather than the coaches coaching an athlete, I encourage team members to coach each other, to talk over the strategy, to say, you know, throw it from here. No, go over to the other side of the court and throw it, bank it, you know, all those things, you'd be surprised. The athletes will listen to each other. And if they practice that, when they come to state games, they'll play it that way. And to me, that's more important is that they talk to each other. They form, truly form a team so that when they arrive at the state games, they're a team. They're a true team. They're not just two players playing together. Okay. Uh, now, there is exceptions to the rules. There always are exceptions to the rule. If you've got an athlete that needs physical help, okay, you can certainly, you can go out there, you can help place the athlete. You know, you, you got to put the, uh, the ramp down that would be an example of helping the athlete you got to put it in the right direction but you can't tell the athlete you know push the ball down the ramp or um, hold the ball and and let it go when when the ramp when it's gone down you know bring it down the ramp halfway and then let go of the ball you can't give those kinds of instructions that's coaching the athlete and that's going to be crossed um, likewise you can't tell uh, an athlete, you know, and we have one in Maryland, we're in uh, Montgomery County that's visually impaired. We can't tell him, Ben, you threw the ball too hard. Ease off next time. We can tell him where the his ball ended up. We can draw out a picture of the geography, but he's got to figure out, oh, how do I adjust? so that we can throw it differently. We stand over the polina and we say, Ben, I'm over the polina. Ben, I'm over here. And Ben adjusts himself, but we're not coaching him and telling him, ah, wait a minute, you're not lined up properly and things like that. Now, Ben has a partner, Owen, and Owen, before Ben gets in there, Owen will tell Ben, where to throw, how hard to throw, you know, bank it against the side. Don't do that. 
and then he'll walk Ben in and he'll put Ben in an approximate position, but he's not going to put him in a final position because Ben's got to do that listening to the voice at the other end. Those are all acceptable coaching, but you notice the coaching happened before Ben stepped in to the court. And once he was in the court, the coaching stopped, except for the person standing over the Polina saying, I'm over here. Any questions on those? Because I think we're, we're seeing more and more of those kinds of athletes that need help. And we certainly, that makes the sport that much more interesting. If no questions there, then let me move on to the uniform requirements. The state of Maryland and these are state regulations. Um, so be aware that long pants or shorts, golf or tennis shorts are appropriate. Um, I've also added that certainly skirts are appropriate. And I, we can discuss what is not too short. I'm sure that, you know, if we can't have, if we say short shorts are not permitted, and that's clearly written in the rules that jeans or running shorts are not allowed. So we're again back with the short shorts. Mini skirts aren't going to be allowed. And that's what I mean by not too short on the skirts. Um, certainly. Athletic shoes that do not damage or harm the playing surface are required. In other words, um, we can't come to the state game with golf shoes with nice, nice spikes on, on them. You know, that, that's not going to be allowed. Um, open tennis shoes where the toes are exposed, sandals where the toes are exposed, those aren't allowed. And the, really, those are, are not allowed from a safety perspective. If you drop the toe, the ball on an enclosed shoes, it's still going to hurt, but at least it's not going to hurt as bad and it may not break the skin if the ball falls on a toe that's unprotected. Hats are permissible, and as a matter of fact, I would say are encouraged, um, especially at the state games when it gets so hot, uh, provided that they don't have any sponsorship or corporate logos, or likewise, you know, the Marlboro hat or the Coors Light uh, beer hats, those kinds of things are not permitted. Um, the hats that say um, your county name, your county team, those are perfectly acceptable uh, logos and uh, sponsorship because you're sponsored by a particular uh, team there collar shirt has been required for competition since 2012 it means that no t-shirts even if it's a team t-shirt even if your team practices in t-shirts and our team does we have a yellow team uh team t-shirt that we practice in but on game days on qualifier days we hand out collared shirts to all of our athletes Before I go on to training consideration equipment, any other questions have come up? Nothing yet. Um, coaching. I'm a really big, big fan of saying that every athlete is unique. Every athlete has to be coached in their own unique way. Um, every athlete reacts differently to it. And for those of you that have taken the coaching, the Special Olympic athlete, you, you know that's one of the things that they stress in that program. And truly, that's what I have discovered with, um, with our athletes in Bocce. Uh, some of the athletes walk on and at their first practice, you realize, man, this person's going to be a great player. By the end of the first practice, they're already, they've got the full understanding of the game and 
you know, you just know this is going to be a start. And then there are other athletes where it takes five years, six years, 10 years before they begin to comprehend the game and they're starting to understand the strategy of the game. To me, it doesn't matter. They're both just as important to my team as that. And the beauty about Special Olympics is why I love it so much is that I can hold on to an athlete like that. And I've got years to work with him and see him develop and gain experience and change. And you can see that smile because for me, they realize somebody's got some confidence in them that they're going to get it. And just the fact they didn't get it in two or three sessions doesn't matter. So that's really what I'd like to stress for this is no matter what the athlete is, no matter how long it takes, for me, once they get it, even if it's 10 years down the road, it's a big victory for me. Uh, during your sessions, your training session, uh, the way we run our, our training sessions in, in Montgomery County is, you know, first thing we do is we set up all the courts. And I try to get athletes involved in putting down the pipes and stuff. A few years back, we had very few athletes who would help out. Nowadays, we've got more and more athletes that are doing it. It's becoming part of the routine of putting the pipes. And you would be amazed how many athletes can actually help put the pipes together. They don't have to carry the pipes together. They just got to put two pieces of pipe together. There's one smaller pipe and it slides into that bigger pipe, you know, and so on. Somebody else lays out the pipes where they've got to be. So it's just like putting a jigsaw puzzles, but the puzzle pieces are put next to each other. So you just got to fit them together. That starts the camaraderie. Everybody starts to be together. In the process of doing that particular activity for me, that becomes part of our warm up because athletes are bending over, they're moving around, they're loosening up all those muscles and things like that. Or else, how many of you really take the time to have a stretching exercise, some warm up things, you know, having the athletes run around the courts or things like that? We never did that before, but having the athletes being part of putting the courts together limbers them up. So to me, that's my warm up part. Then sometimes we'll have a skill session, but usually right after the warm up, the, the next thing that I do, and I've just learned over time, it, it makes a difference from athletes because I've heard comments from the caregivers, but particularly from the parents. I take a roll call and I make eye contact with every single athlete. I look at them, they say they're here. And if I want to say a comment back to them, I do it so that every single athlete I talk to at least during the roll call. And that makes a difference for some athlete because now they really feel part of the team they feel the coach knows them. They know the coach has paid attention to them. Even if it's for a half a second, it's enough time for them to make a difference in their life and for that smile to show up on their face. There are times when we do sit down and we'll talk about a particular skill, the underhand throw, how to, where to put your legs, where to put your, law, your hands when you're throwing, where to stand, you know, behind the foul line. But oftentimes what I'll do is I'll instruct the coaches to say, work on this particular skill today. And then we divide ourselves up into teams and we play games, you know, simulated competition for the rest of practice. Um, at the end of the session, if we did not have at the beginning during roll, right after roll call, if I didn't hold a team meeting at that point to explain to everybody, 
what's going to happen? You know, when is the qualifiers? What uniform are we going to hand out? When are we going to hand out the uniforms so that you have them for the competition? Um, any of those kinds of things. If I've got paperwork to hand out, all of that, we either do it when I do the roll call, but if there's too many at absence or too many athletes coming late, I may hold off that until that end of the session and do it at the end of the session. Especially if I want people to take paperwork home, then I'll hold it off till the end because I've learned if I give the piece of paper at the beginning of the session, that piece of paper is going to be on the grass and we're going to be chasing the pieces of paper all over the field at the first gust of wind. If I put it at the end of the sessions, they'll have that piece of paper and they'll walk back to their cars, to their minivans, to their uh, ride on uh, bus, wherever it is they're going. And that piece of paper will get to the right person at the right time. Um, so under um, training strategy, and, and again, we in Montgomery County, we typically will adapt that during our training competition. And what I do is I try to put people of like strength to compete against each other so that they, they, all the athletes really get the same kind of competition that they're going to get at the same at the state game. So there are some days we don't allow them to throw the polina. The person who's going to be on that particular court places the polina. Could be a short polina, could be a long polina, could be the polina along the rails. Whatever that particular coach feels is appropriate for this particular team or based on what I've asked people to focus on. Um, we may say, okay, we're going to focus on bank shots. We may not put the Polina right up against the, the boards, but we'll put it close enough that doing a bank shot makes a lot of sense. Um, we'll practice defensive rules. That is, we'll throw the first ball so that it blocks the Polina. Um, we'll do offensive rules so that they're trying to hit a particular bocce ball, um, not necessarily hitting the polina, but hitting a particular bocce ball to knock it out of where it is, and, and so on and so forth. I'm sure most of you by now have learned all kinds of different strategies. Does anybody want to volunteer um, some strategies that you've used for your drills? Go ahead and raise your hand and um, we'll open up the mic. Not seeing any hands raised yet. Okay, not a problem. Courts and equipment. Um, as most of you know, most of us practice on grass. Some of us have the luxuries of practicing on crushed stone and by the turf. I'm talking about what we see at the state games. To me, that's a very nice turf, grass, whatever we call it. On the grass, we've got a tremendous amount of variety. Last year, for the first time, what we did uh, towards the end of the season, we checked with the park and planning folks or the park people um, and said, hey, when are they going to come out and mow? the lawn the next time at the park that we practice. And we were told it was another 10 days away stuff. So we ended up having one of the coaches that went out there with his lawn mower. And he mowed the area where we practice down. Made a huge difference for our athletes because now instead of practicing in six inch tall grass, they were practicing in much shorter grass and stuff. So. If you've got those kinds of opportunity where you think you can get away with mowing the lawn or you know you can ask permission to go do it, absolutely do it because it'll give your athletes that much 
better practice. I'm not going to say that it gives them an advantage at the state game, but it gives them a better opportunity for practice, for a meaningful practice, where they don't feel that they're out there um, throwing the balls in the jungle. Practice um, should always include a solid court barrier. And, and the reason we've got that here is that, you know, oftentimes you can't, you know, what do you do when um, you don't have enough courts? Sometimes you just take a spray paint can and you spray the line on the grass or you take a rope and you outline it. In some ways, those things are better than nothing. But the athletes don't have an opportunity of working, okay, what happens when I've got a solid barrier? And the solid barrier can be wood and PVC. That's typically what we see, um, of course, that we build ourselves and we bring to the location or to the state games. But in some cases, I'm sure people have seen where there might be a curbing, you know, a concrete curbing or an asphalt curbing and things like that. And, and those work fine also um, because it teaches the athletes how to use the advantage of the solid court. Um, as I said, practice must, must always include a demarcated court line, you know, so it can be um, rope, cones. Uh, the cones makes it difficult because typically they don't have a line that connects the cones. It's an imaginary line, so it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, there are plenty of websites out there that sell you uh, courts that are made out of um, ropes or canvas straps, um, et cetera. Again, if it's a question, you can't carry solid pipes to your practice area, but you can carry a bag full of canvas courts with a canvas strap courts. Please do that. At least the athlete gets the idea of what it is to play within a certain limits stuff. So, uh, bocce balls. In, in Maryland, we end up using the competition balls that are between 107 millimeters and 110 millimeters. We also have a number of, of athletes that use lighter balls. Um, I know in the high school, they even use a more of a spongy balls with um, sand in the middle of it. Uh, so depending on where you're playing and what you're playing, there's other ones. On the, on the lighter balls, if, if, you're pract if your athlete practices all season long with lighter balls, make sure we got to find out, you know, is the state going to allow them to use that as the state games? If it's not going to be permitted at the state games, and, and I just don't remember off the top of my head what the rules are this year for, for the state games, then consider doing the heavier balls but having your athletes practice on a short court because it would make more sense that your athlete spends the season practicing what they're going to face at the state games. Now, um, to go back to the courts, we said that they ought to be solid. Um, so they can be solid wooden boards at least, and I would make them at least six inches high. Um, they could be PVC pipe. We use a two inch pipe um, because it just makes it that much easier to put them together at practice and they're not that heavy and I can put in the back of my pickup truck. The state uses the four inch pipe. Um, they're much heavier. They're a lot harder to handle. They're um, but they work just as well, either one. The other item that I've seen happen quite a few times is the gutters, where people will buy either plastic gutters and put them 
um, with their appropriate sleeves to lock them together, or they'll buy or they'll get the aluminum gutters. Um, that certainly is a different way. You can then take it apart and put it back together. You know, you can put it in storage and stuff. We find that the PVC is the easiest to assemble and ends up being more rigid in the long run than a lot of things. Plus, if you do use gutters that are made out of PVC, when you join them together, there's always a lip where they, they join. So now that introduces an unknown and um, when you bank the balls and, and things like that, which is something that you're not going to see at the state game. Um, and that's what I mean by the raised edge um, on the next bullet uh, point. Again, what we talked about earlier, if you've got a PVC pipe or if you've got a gutter that's a half moon, if the ball rolls up on those and rolls back into the court, you know it didn't get all the way to the top of the board. And therefore, that's still legitimate. If it's a solid board, you know, it's a two by six or something like that, and that ball rolls on top of that board, board and it's clear it was on top of that. The rule says that ball is now out of play. So that's one of the disadvantages of having a flat top board and versus something that's rounded. Any questions so far? Nope, nothing. Okay. Divisioning. This is the sheet that I have, and I always give it out to everybody um, at the beginning of the season when I do these this training and stuff, and I religiously fill it out. I'll tell you right off the bat, it's overkill. The the requirements for coming up with the score does not ask you to measure all eight balls. It says measure the three closest ball to the Polina and add those scores, those nine scores together to turn in as the score. The reason I measure all eight balls is so that I have a record when I go up, come home and I look at my athlete and I say, okay, does this athlete at 30 feet consistently have all of the balls clustered around the, the Polina? Or does this athlete consistently have all eight balls beyond the Polina? Because this athlete can't slow the ball down enough. You know, so I can look at what this athlete does consistently at each of the distance. And then I can use that information when I pair the athlete with other athletes. Um, because I may put together a strong thrower and a weak thrower together. But I need all of this information to do that. The division by zero is because I'm looking at the average distance at each of those um, distance, the 30 feet, the 40 feet, and the 50 feet. One of the rules you want to kind of remember when you're taking and doing this pro process is that you're asking the athletes to get as close to the polina as possible and even hit the polina. But the moment they hit the polina, and when all the balls have settled down, pick that polina up, back up, and again, put it in the middle of the 30-foot line or the 40-foot line or the 50-foot line, wherever it is. I know that that isn't the reality for the game because in a game, when you hit the polina and the polina moves over and it's part of the strategy, you want to move the polina. But for the scoring purposes, we don't follow that strategy of the game. We say we always keep it there. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. 
And the final thing that I had was any additional rules that you want or coaching uh, guides and videos are at these links. Now, um, as I said before, from the rules perspective, what will apply in the state of Maryland will be broadcasted during the webinars. Um, so please do attend those so you understand whatever are Maryland specific rules, what are the changes to the rules. Uh, if your team participates in any of in a competition in other states, they may have different rules than we have. So become familiar with what those states have, um, you know, so that your team isn't at a disadvantage when you get there. The coaching guides and video, it's been a while since I've been in that book and look at it, but I know that at one point, uh, Special Olympic put a really big effort in those training guides um, so that a lot of the pictures are actually a link to a little video. And so when you click, if you go up to the, excuse me, on the website and you click on the picture, there's going to be a little video that comes up and shows you whatever the move is, whatever they're trying to teach you that's in that picture. So don't hesitate to use that as a means of refining your knowledge and everything else. And really, that's all I had for this evening. So, I'll, Kendall, do we want to open up the mic and anybody can ask questions? Or do you have something that you want to first talk about uh, before you open up the mic for folks? Um, sure. So the one thing that I wanted to mention is the usage of ramps. So within the Special Olympics rules for bocce, it doesn't go into detail about any specifications with ramps. It essentially reads that any accommodation that an athlete needs that's approved by um, the committee is able to be used at a state games or at a local competition. Um, so one thing that I saw recently at our Interscholastic Unified Sports Indoor Bocce Championships in the school system is we had an athlete who used his leg as a ramp, and I just haven't seen anything like that before, so I thought it was kind of a cool way to do a take on ramp. Um, if you want to keep on pushing that, um, we're trying to build our program and athletes who think that they may not be able to roll the bocce ball that they can still bocce. The other thing that I like everyone to kind of check out before we have our pre webinar is playing with teams. So we always offer teams at training, but we never have a spot to This is a great way for us to have a higher capacity for more people to come out this summer game. I want to put a little button here now to try to start thinking about that with these programs. If you have any questions or anything, please just reach out to me, and I'd love to discuss it further. Um, but I'm more than willing to open up everybody's line if you just want to do a little bit of discussion. So give me one second while I unmute everyone. And just put yourself on self. I had one of these, I had the hard top version of this. And Ralph Banner was wrong. You can't get him to flip. It would be a lot of fun. If folks, if you can put yourself on mute on your own phone until you get an actual question. All right, I think I got it. Um, so, question from Elizabeth Connolly. During competition, can an athlete ask the referee to tell them which ball is closer to the Polina? Let's say it is difficult to determine which ball, red and green, is closer when at the end of the court, can an athlete ask this question? The athlete can ask that at any time during competition and the referee, and as a matter of fact, the athlete can walk on the outside of the court down to check that themselves. Now, 
the, the, the things have got to be reasonable. The athlete can't use that as a means of slowing down the game. Um, but they can ask at any time, and the referee should always answer that question. Awesome. Thank you, Ernie. That's the only other question that I'm seeing right now. You know, if we've got if we've got folks on mute, don't hesitate to raise your hand, and uh, we'll unmute you. And I do want to thank everybody for coming tonight and listening to me. I know a lot of you have already heard me before, so I try to change it a little bit every year. But there is still some basic information that I, I have to repeat every single year. Um, I think that in the future, we will take a look at having some master uh, coaches training which is more interactive where we don't go into all the different rules but we sort of bounce around some ideas on um, how to coach what to do at, at training and things like that and if you're interested in that please let us know and we'll definitely organize those kinds of training session i know that that happens in other sports and i'd be more than happy to um coordinate to see that this happens at this one so that we can to have a different take on this and you're not listening to oh for crying out loud he's going to explain the court 60 foot longs 12 foot wide as if i hadn't known that for the past 25 years and stuff like that so please uh, you know let us know how we can help uh, do these training sessions better um, and to meet your needs I think that would be great. I will be sending out a little quiz just like we did last year via SurveyMonkey within the next few days. So I will make sure to include a little box that will say, if you're interested in attending a master's class, please check here. That way we can see how many people we have interested and what topics we could put on the agenda. Thank so you, Kim. So much any more questions or anything. So thank you, Rennie, so much for sharing all of your expertise with us tonight. I know I myself learned a ton. So thank you. And I will be sending out the link to this video. So just in case any attendees have a few questions about what was said, you are able to watch it again. Please also send it out to your assistant coaches. It's a great resource just to freshen up on some skills before we start bocce season um but that is all we have for you unless Brenny, you have anything else you would like to share no i'm all done for tonight awesome so thank you so much everyone i will talk to you in march for the preseason webinar have a great night thank you